Welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to thank Brooklyn Marks for coming and holding this presentation for us. We uh, really have been looking forward to this presentation. It's such important information um, and one that we can use on so many levels. Um, I'll let Brooklyn take over. I just wanna mention that if you would like to choose the language button at the bottom, you can choose your language and we have interpreters present so that they can interpret to French if you so prefer. Right, and with that, I'd like to hand it over to Brooklyn. Awesome, yeah. Uh, thank you, Susie and everyone at Curious May Canada for having me here. Um, this is something, a topic that I'm really passionate about, kind of exploring with people and exploring with families, especially who have kids with disabilities and SMA. Um, I talked to Susie kind of at the beginning of our session and we were chatting about that there is for um, people 15 years and older are being able to have a um, therapy package be sent if they're registered with Cure SMA Canada. Um, so for anyone that's interested in getting that, um, it'd be a really, good thing to kind of get registered and be able to access um, all of these things that can help your mental and physical health. Um, so if you are registered, I think Susie said that you can go to the website and register so that you can access that package. Um, did I miss anything on that, Susie? Uh, no, that's, that's correct. And anybody that ha is already registered with us, we have a brand new program that we've um, brought in that's more, much more in depth of, um, you know, so we can break out groups. And uh, so we need everybody to re-register, even if you've been registered with us for years. Um, so yes, please go to the website and register. And uh, we are sending out, and this has nothing to do with that. It's just in sideline is, we are sending out therapy packages to all members 15 years of age and older um, for mental and physical health. And uh, um, yeah, it's a great little box that we've put together and uh, we're really excited about it. And it is in conjunction with these therapy courses that we're taking through the conference here. So it's all together. All right, with that, I'll let you go to it, Brooklyn. All right, I am going to share my screen. Is everyone able to see that? <laughs> awesome, okay. Yeah, so um, today kind of, we're gonna be exploring some advocacy and assertiveness for parents, adults, and kids with SMA. Um, I'm really excited to be here and kind of explore these topics with you um, a bit more on a detailed level. Uh, everyone is pretty familiar with the roles that we have to take. Um, as people or adults raising kids with SMA and kind of be involved in the advocacy world. And so I think it'll be fun to explore these in a bit more detail. So before I jump into what I've prepared, I just wanna take a moment and introduce myself. Some of you might know me from the community, others might not. Uh, so my name is Brooklyn, I am a disabled therapist that lives in Guelph, Ontario. I'm just finishing up my Master's of Arts in Counseling Psychology. And so I'm working towards becoming a registered psychotherapist. Um, and so right now I'm interning as a therapist right now at a private practice in Ontario. Um, I have SMA type two. I was diagnosed at 18 months old. And I, a big part of Living with SMA and my life experience as a disabled woman has definitely formed uh, my passion uh, for the work that I'm doing as a therapist. It's led me to wanna to work with individuals, families, and communities as they navigate different disability-related issues, um, things like grief, diagnosis, burnout, medical trauma, uh, and advocacy. So one of the reasons that I'm really passionate about supporting others with advocacy is because it is such a large part of disability, parenting, and caregiving. Uh, it's really woven into our life um, for everyone's life, but especially families uh, with a member who has a disability. 
And so because of this, I think it's really important to explore advocacy and learn about how we can use our voice in the best way while also taking care of ourselves and our kids in the process. And so when we think of advocacy, a lot of things that come to mind first is things like protests, interviews, awareness campaigns, and the like. Uh, and while these are definitely really important parts of advocacy, there's a lot more to it. So advocacy is woven into many different areas of life. Um, so I've in included some of the uh, main areas that we advocate uh, at some level. There's probably a lot more, and depending on how much you zone out, zone in, um, it will change. But these are kind of the core umbrellas that seem to cover the most of um, advocacy with SMA. And so the first part is medical advocacy. Uh, and so this is involving advocating for access to therapies and treatments, having proper and specialized care, um, as well as accessing uh, essential supports and equipment. Um, so we're all very familiar with that one. The second is educational and vocational advocacy, which is focused on things related to um, disability accommodations and accessibility. So this might look at making sure that buildings are physically accessible and properly set up and that our disability needs are being met in these spaces. And then the third is social advocacy, which might look like advocacy within personal relationships or within the community. Uh, this might be something um, like raising awareness, confronting ableism, advocating for representation, um, and stuff like this. And then political advocacy involves fighting for human rights, focusing on having policy and legislation that is supportive of essential funding and programs and services that support us as families with SMA. And so these four areas, you know, we could zone in and talk about each one of these in endless detail, um, but realistically within the next hour and a half, we're not gonna be able to dive into every single one um, specifically, but I hope that the present, like the, the information I've provided in this presentation can be used for each of these areas. And so um, I hope that it's helpful in some capacity, regardless of which one you're kind of focusing on. And so for the structure of this presentation, I've kind of narrowed it down into four big chunks. Um, so the first section, we're gonna focus on advocating as parents of kids with SMA. Um, and so this will look at using your voice to advocate for your child or your children, um, as well as taking care of yourself as a caregiver in the process. Um, and then from there, we can go into exploring ways to foster advocacy in kids with SMA and to help them develop their own voice and their own confidence so that they can use it as in the future when they become adults with SMA. Um, and then that will kind of bring us into the third section, which focuses on transitioning to self-advocacy for young adults with SMA um, as they start to use their own voice to navigate life as a disabled adult. And then, as I mentioned in the previous slide, advocacy is really interwoven into every area of life with SMA. And so we're gonna finish off the presentation with the fourth section for question and answers. And so this will hopefully give us an opportunity to kind of discuss things that pop up in your mind that wasn't necessarily covered in the material that I prepared. So for the first section, we're able to start with advocating as a parent of kids with SMA. And so to start off here, I think it's important to look at why advocacy matters especially as a parent of a child with SMA. And so there are really a lot of components to this, but at its core is the need to protect your child and help make sure that they get their needs met. And so as a parent, you are the voice of your child. And so it's really important to use your voice to make sure that they are getting everything that they need 
to thrive in their childhood. And it's also important because it helps show them how to advocate for themselves when they're older. And so many kids with SMA will become adults with SMA. And this is obviously a lot more and more frequent right now with treatments and therapies becoming more advanced and being more available. And so it's important to make sure that the kids have the skills that they need to advocate for themselves when they transition to adulthood. And so another area that's important for advocacy is that it offers awareness and education. And so when you're advocating for your child, you're using your voice to share what their needs are. And so this will inadvertently teach others a bit about what life with SMA is like and how to effectively support you um, and other people they encounter that are in your situation. So similar to what we discussed before, um, there are many scenarios that you'll have to advocate um, as a parent of a kid with SMA. And these are just a few that I've listed that are really common. Um, and so whether you've been in the disability world for a while or whether you're brand new to it, it can be really overwhelming to know how to use your voice effectively in all of these different scenarios. How can you access medical care and treatment? How can you make sure that your child at school is getting the support that they need throughout the day when you're not there? What does it look like to fight for essential equipment? Um, maybe you're trying to advocate locally for an accessible swing at your park, or maybe you're trying to ensure that your child's care is done in a way that supports their needs and has them feeling comfortable. And so all of these scenarios are, you know, situations where you will have to use your voice to kind of work towards these goals and help your child get these needs met. And so most families with SNA will have to advocate in all of these scenarios at one point in their life. And it's probably going to be repeatedly and it's probably going to be over and over again. Um, and so it's important to kind of explore what this advocacy looks like. So one thing I like to do with big topics like advocacy is kind of break it down into manageable pieces. Um, and so when you break down advocacy, there are really three important ingredients that we want to be mindful of. And so the first is to know what you're fighting for, how to use strong communication, and also how to take care of yourself. Um, so we're gonna go into each of these with a little bit more detail. So the first one is to know what you are fighting for. And this really comes down to making sure that when you're going in to advocate, you know exactly what you want to get out of the situation. Um, so this kind of comes with educating yourselves on the rights of you and your child, so that when you know that, you know, what you're entitled to and what you're allowed to ask for, you can go into the conversation confidently knowing what you need. And having this confidence is important to make sure that you're able to get your voice heard. And so if you find it really challenging to do this, whether you know you find that you are a people pleaser or you're not really sure where to get the information, uh, it can be really helpful to connect with your community and learn from their shared experiences. Uh, you can learn what worked for them if they were in a previous situation that's similar to yours. Um, and you can also find resources that might help you along the way. And the second ingredient for advocacy is to use strong communication. So when we're advocating for our needs, we really want to make sure that we're doing so in a way that was most likely to get our message across. So it's helpful to be really specific and direct about what we're looking for. Clear and concise is probably the best way to get messages across and to be heard. Um, if you need to explain what you're looking for, definitely try to have um, your resources and information there to back you up if you need it. Um, it can be helpful to also be firm and repeated if you're getting pushed back. And, you know, this, with this topic specifically, I really want to recognize that these moments are really overwhelming and can make us really emotional. Um, as parents, you want to protect your kid in the best way possible. 
And so when you're advocating and the person is not listening or receiving your message or pushing back and not taking any action that aligns with your advocacy and what your child needs, you know, it can be really frustrating and it makes sense that, you know, you know what's best for your child and you're trying to be heard. And when that doesn't happen, uh, you can feel really angry or flustered in those moments and not really know how to continue moving forward to advocate for what you need and what your child needs. Um, and so for these moments, I really encourage you to call in a trusted person that you have in your corner who can support you and advocate either on your behalf or on your child's behalf, um, or just support you as you advocate for your child. Um, you know, making sure that they're able to take your other child while you're focusing on your child with SMA, or maybe that's getting them to research the information when you're busy taking care of your child. Um, so really leaning in on your community as best you can during these moments uh, can be really helpful and taking care of yourself and making sure that you're able to use these strong communication strategies. And this kind of weaves into the thir third ingredient of advocacy, which is to take care of yourself. Um, and so, you know, ad we all know that advocacy is really hard. And over time, especially raising a kid with SMA and, you know, having this repeat over and over again, Doing advocacy consistently can really wear you down and make you feel exhausted. Um, and so, especially when this is on top of all of our other responsibilities as parents, like working um, and parenting and, you know, doing any other caregiving, maybe you have an aging parent or you have other children. So it's important to make sure that you're attending to your own needs um, as much as you can. This means that you're making sure that you're getting the proper nutrition and sleep, and you're being mindful of getting exercise, time for yourself, support. And so this sounds really unrealistic for a lot of families. Um, you know, I've heard this a lot where they think that they don't have time. They, you know, it feels like they're just unable to take that time for themselves. And, you know, it makes sense that for parents, it's really natural to want to put aside your needs to take care of your children first. Uh, but it's helpful to remember that taking care of you is taking care of your kids. And the best kind of description for this that I can think of is to almost think about the safety protocols that flight attendants use um, on the plane. And if there's an emergency, one of the things that you're supposed to do as an adult is put on your oxygen mask before you put on the oxygen mask of your child. And, you know, the reason that this is the case is that you are unable to put on your child's oxygen mask if you yourself are not breathing. And so putting on your mask first is the best scenario to make sure that you and your child are safe and breathing and good. And so this same thing goes for your care. So in order to take care of your kids and be in a space where you're able to advocate for them, you have to make sure that your own needs are being met. Um, and so one thing that can help with this also is to figure out your non-negotiables. Um, so this is a lot like kind of picking your battles in a way. Um, and I, I put this in here because as parents of kids with SMA, there are endless amount of things that you can advocate for. It's, it's quite daunting when you think of all of the different things that you will have an opportunity to advocate for. And so realistically, it's impossible for you to advocate for everything and to do it perfectly every time. And so it's really important to determine what your needs are and that are what ones are most important for your family to make sure that you're directing your energy into those areas, into that advocacy that really matters for you, your child, and your family. And so the last part of taking care of yourself is to give yourself grace through this process. 
remind yourself that advocacy is a lot of work and it doesn't come with a manual very similar to parenting. Um, you're, you're advocating as a parent of a kid with a disability for the first time and it's not easy. You have to learn along the way and there's going to be bumps. Um, and, and through this all, you're allowed to take breaks. And I hope you can kind of give yourself the grace to allow yourself to do that. Give yourself permission to take care of yourself so that you can better take care of your children and your family. And so to kind of wrap up this section on parental advocacy, I just wanna remind you that this work matters. Um, I think a lot of the time advocacy is so exhausting and it might feel like, you know, your voice isn't making a difference and it's not really changing anything. And it just seems really insurmountable. Um, and so I want to remind you that your advocacy is, you know, it's doing something, your voice is making a difference. It's important, every little bit matters. Um, and, you know, it might also be helpful to look at it that your advocacy is not only helping your child, but others as well that you might not even know. And so in a lot of ways, advocacy is a ripple effect um, and can help families that you might not even you know, know are being helped from something that you advocated for for your child. Um, and then the last piece of this is that your child sees you and learns from you. So when your children watch, if they watch you advocate for them, they see what advocacy looks like and the power of using your own voice. And so that's something that is valuable. And this is something that will help them as they grow into their own advocate and support them in having a strong voice in adulthood as well. So speaking of helping kids learn how to advocate, um, we're gonna shift into how to foster advocacy in kids with SMA. So when we talk about fostering advocacy in kids with SMA, one of the big things that we want to remember is that if we want our children to feel comfortable and confident using their voice in the world, this starts with us. And so we know that our kids are going to grow into adults with SMA, and this comes with unique challenges because as a person with a disability, you're living in a world that is built for non-disabled people. And so as adults, they will come across a lot of similar barriers that they did as children, but instead of you advocating on their behalf, they're gonna be the ones who are using their voice and advocating for themselves. And so we really want to think about how to instill these skills when our kids are young and help them develop the confidence to use their voice um, and kind of be able to move into adulthood feeling better about speaking up and advocating for what they need. So building a confident and assertive voice is really important for kids for a lot of reasons. Uh, and so as we mentioned before, it helps to protect our kids from, um, you know, of creating a culture of consent where they know that they can speak up for themselves and what feels good for them. Um, they're able to maintain their autonomy and really be a leader in their own care and in their own life. And this is, you know, this goes for all kids, but I think it's especially important when you throw in SMA into the mix, because there will be a lot of situations in their life where they have to advocate for themselves and their needs and face barriers of being told no or being pushed back. Um, and so building the confidence and assertiveness while kids are young is something that we want to work towards so that they know how to move forward and get their voice heard. So like I said, kids with disabilities are living in a world that is built for non-disabled people. And so not only does this encompass things like buildings that are inaccessible or policies that prevent access to funding for necessary equipment or treatment, but it also comes with stigmatization or perceptions that you know, can serve as barriers to them. 
So kids with disabilities will likely have moments in their lives where they are told by other people that they have to be grateful for what they have, that they are bossy, that they are an inconvenience, uh, and so on. And so messages like this might be overt or they might be subliminal, but either way, these messages can make kids feel like they aren't able to speak out and they're not allowed to use their voice. And so one of the big things that we can do as parents is to counteract these narratives and make sure that your children are feeling seen and worthy. And so looking at what your child needs to feel comfortable speaking out. And so some of these might be to know that their voice matters, that they know that they're the boss of their own body, that they're allowed to ask for help when they need it, that they're not a burden to you or anyone else for having those needs, that there's nothing wrong with them, and that you are there in their corner to support them. And so when we raise kids knowing all of these things, it serves them by acting as a protective factor to make sure that they're not in any situations that make them additionally vulnerable and that they're able to grow into adults who have these core beliefs and can constantly advocate for their needs. So now that we kind of know the why, um, it's helpful to shift to the how. Um, so how can we help kids learn to be their own advocate? How can we help kids learn to develop the skills that they need to effectively advocate for their needs in a way that keeps them safe and comfortable? And so this starts in our own home. And so I'm gonna be jumping into a few different things that can help you help your kids feel more confident using their voice. Um, but before we kind of move into these different ideas, I want to mention a couple of things. So first, these strategies are not meant to shame you in any way if you're not currently implementing them in your home. So these strategies are solely things to be mindful of that may help you support your child developing these advocacy skills. Um, it's okay if you do not implement these skills perfectly. Um, you're human as well, and it's unrealistic for you to follow these to a T every time. And sh you showing up for your kids and trying is enough. And also, just before we jump in, uh, we might talk about things that kind of feel a little overwhelming or might hit close to home. And it's okay if this is the case. If this happens to you, follow it up with a deep breath. And if you want to discuss it more in the Q&A, we can totally come back to it um, and kind of explore what doesn't sit right. So one of the first things that can help kids know that they're able to use their voice and speak up is to allow them to question. So oftentimes as adults, it can be easy to want kids to just follow direction and listen. Uh, we want them to know that, you know, you, they can trust you, that you know what's best, and that they just follow along. And, you know, this is something that a lot of parents experience. But what's really important to remember is that kids are curious. It's a natural and normal part of their development to ask questions, to be curious about the world. And so when we shut the store on curiosity and ask them to do things solely because we ask, uh, we tell them that they must always listen to adults and that they're not allowed to speak their thoughts. Um, and so if we want to raise our children to be strong and assertive adults who know the value of their voice, we can't really expect instant obedience and compliance in childhood. And so encouraging your child to question authority is part of teaching consent and assertiveness. And even though it might feel frustrating right now, it is a gift for them in the future. And it's, it's an investment. Thank you, Brooklyn, for letting me know that because I have an 11-year-old daughter that's always questioning our authority. So 
she will be a great adult later on in life. So that's good. <laughs> Beautiful. I love to hear that. <laughs> um, it, can I share a, a story? Yes. Molly sure used can. to be one of those kids that would hide behind me all the time. And even if I said, say, you know, here's so-and-so say hi, she'd be hiding behind me. But what I did as she was uh, growing if we went into a mall or something, I would wind my way through the crowd instead of clearing people for her to force her into the position of having to advocate for herself because she was going to need that those skills later in life. And uh, yeah, just little hints like that, like for the people that have younger kids, like young kids, don't do everything for them. Make them do things for themselves from an early age for sure. as much as they can. Yeah, I love that. It's so true. So an example of this is a really big one that a lot of parents are familiar with is the because I said so. Um, so for many parents and families, this is something that comes up a lot. And it makes sense that this is something that parents kind of move towards instinctively. Um, if they're in the heat of the moment and they're feeling really overwhelmed and dysregulated, it's natural to just not want to explain yourself, not be questioned, not be challenged, just this is what we're doing, listen, done. Um, so it's important to remember that you can maintain your role as a leader in your home while also encouraging your children to question authority. So both of these things can be true. Um, so this can really help them know that if they're in a situation in their future where something doesn't sit right with them, and they aren't getting their needs met, that they're allowed to question the person with them, even if they're in a position of authority, even if they're a doctor, even if they're a therapist, whatever the situation might be, they're allowed to question that. So when they're told that they don't qualify for a piece of equipment, they can challenge it. When they're told that they only are allowed to get three hours of care a day, they can challenge it. And so some things that we can do to maintain this leadership role while also allowing them to still tap into their curiosity is to say things like, here is why I said no, or I don't have time to explain this right now, but I will as soon as I can, or thank you for asking me, it's important to ask questions. Also, I appreciate your questions, and as soon as you're safe, I will explain. So the last one's really important for situations where they do need to listen right away because they're, it's unsafe. And so they really do need to listen to you in those moments, but you're still allowing them to know that they are allowed to question, that you appreciate their questions and so forth. So the next little piece of teaching advocacy for kids is to look at our role as a model for them. And so reminding ourselves that the voice you use with your kids becomes their internal voice when they are older. And so I'm sure most of you have heard the phrase that kids are like sponges. And it's true because kids soak up and learn so much from watching the adults around them. And so a really great way to teach kids how to ask for what they want is to model them that behavior. And so we can show them how to use their voice to get their needs met. So there are many different situations where you can model advocacy to your kids. Um, for this particular example, I am gonna look at a medical appointment. And so if I set the scene, I think most of us have either been there or can picture what's gonna happen, which is you're in an appointment with a professional and they are pushing for a certain solution that you and your child know already will not work. You are in the situation, you're maybe working with an occupational therapist and you have tried multiple different chair trays before and nothing worked. Let's say your daughter is named Sally. And so your, your daughter Sally really doesn't want one. And she said this to you and to the OT, but the OT is still pushing for you to try different styles. And so in this kind of a moment, one way you can model advocacy to your child is to say really clearly, Sally has tried multiple chair trays and said that she doesn't want one. 
much. Sally knows herself best. Let's look at other options. And so you advocating in this way may not seem like a big deal, um, but it makes a bigger difference than you realize because that moment shows Sally that she knows herself best. She's allowed to say no. My parent trusts me and we can problem solve together. And so this is just one instance where you can model advocacy that can really impact your child and help them understand how they can advocate for themselves in the future. There are many different examples, like I said, um, but this is one that I thought might be helpful for a lot of families because I've heard this kind of a situation a lot um, and it pops up frequently. So the next thing that we can explore to foster advocacy in kids with SMA is narration. And so this is simply speaking out what's happening around the child so that they can start making connections in their world. And so when we, you know, there's different forms of narration that we're gonna talk about. The first one that we'll look at is to narrate their needs. Um, and so this helps kids not only learn to identify what they need, but also make connections about what they can do to meet that need. Um, so a simplified one that, you know, might help for younger kids is to say, Joe, you look really cold right now. You're shivering. Here's a blanket. And so that teaches Joe that his need is that he's cold and that a solution to that is asking for a blanket and getting a blanket. And so this is kind of aligns with the first ingredient of advocacy that we talked about, which is to know what you're fighting for. And so this is a simplified version for kids um, and you can kind of adapt it as they go older um, so that they still learn these connections. And so the next way that you can use narration is to narrate when your kids use a strong voice. Um, so this really helps them know that you hear them and that their voice matters. And so this kind of goes along with the second ingredient, which is to use strong communication. Um, so this might look like saying, your head was getting tired, so you asked me to be repositioned. I love how you used your strong voice to ask me for help. And so this just really reassures your child on how to ask for things in the future so that they can do this again when they have other needs that pop up. And then another way you can use narration, which is the last one that we're gonna talk about, um, is to narrate their story of success. And this really helps kids reflect on what they did well so that they can do the same thing in the future. And so one of the examples that I'm gonna talk about here, the example is um, a parent is doing dishes and their child is interrupting them to be asked for help going to the bathroom. And so this is a common story I hear a lot from parents who have kids with disabilities. Um, there's kind of two parts of this where the parent really wants their kids to ask for support and ask for what they need and not to feel bad about needing their help. But in those instances, it can be really natural to feel annoyed or frustrated without meaning to. Maybe you sighed, maybe you rolled your eyes, Maybe you, you know, had a tone that was a little harsher than you intended it. And so a lot of times parents feel guilty afterwards, you know, wanting to make sure that their kid still knows that they're allowed to ask for help and that, you know, they still will do this in the future. So one of the things that you can do in these moments is to tell them the story of success. And this just might be kind of recapping what happened. So saying, you saw that I was doing the dishes and you needed help going to the bathroom. You remembered our conversation that when you have to go to the bathroom, you come and ask me for help. You asked for it, we went to the bathroom because your health matters most. And so I love that you asked for what you needed. And this kind of story will reassure the child that using their voice to ask for what they need is a good and important thing for them to do. And this builds their foundation and core belief to use their voice and it'll help kids as they get older and need to advocate for their needs more and more. 
So moving away from narration, um, another tool that can be helpful in teaching and fostering advocacy is to simply practice it. And so this sounds really simple, but practicing advocacy is a great way to help kids feel more confident in using their voice when they're in a more pressing situation. And this is very similar to story, Susie's story um, of you know, creating opportunities for kids to use their strong voice and to do that themselves. Um, and so the example that I had written for this was that a child at, their, at your child's school is touching their chair and they're not feeling comfortable with it. And so instead of just saying, I'm gonna call their mom and tell them that they need to stop touching your chair, it would you know, be more of a conversation like, what do you think they need to know? How do you think we can tell this to them? And so giving this opportunity for your child to advocate for themselves in a safe space with your support is a great way to help them practice these same skills that they're gonna need as adults. Um, and so this is a great way to do that. Um, you might also choose to practice advocacy through playing. Um, sometimes, you know, you might be able to do this through dolls, stuffed animals, or even role-playing the situations. If your child's coming to you and saying that they feel uncomfortable in a certain situation, speaking up, you know, role-playing with them in this situation to help them feel more confident can be really helpful for them. And then to kind of go along with this is to use collaboration. Um, and so this kind of ties in with practicing advocacy, but uh, it's a bit more focused on including your child in the process. And so while we may be our kid's voice in many situations, it's important for them to be part of the process and help them learn to problem solve, build their confidence, uh, and let you know, let them know that you're in their corner. Um, and so that they can feel safer advocating when they know that they have a safety net to fall back on. Um, and so these kind of ones that we went through are the main ideas for fostering advocacy with kids with SMA. Um, I do wanna just remind everyone again that these are just general strategies to be mindful of. Um, and I know that it is a lot to dive into. So um, I encourage you to still give yourself grace through this process. Um, and then this will take us into our last section before the Q&A, which is focused on helping young adults with SMA move into self-advocacy. Uh, so you might have noticed that most of the strategies that we talked about for fostering advocacy in kids with SMA um, is really explored with the intention to help them advocate for themselves when they are older. And so we're gonna look at what this stage looks like. And so one of the big parts of this transition, especially for parents, is to move through the feelings that come with stepping back. So as your child becomes older and starts to advocate for themselves more and more frequently, there are a lot of times that parents will feel worried about their child getting their needs met, trusting that their child has the skills to advocate for themselves, and they might find it really hard to sit back and let them take on the role that you've, hold, you've had for so long. You know, you, you're, by the time they transition, you feel like you're really in your groove with advocacy and, you know, stepping back and letting them take on the role, knowing they might make the same mistakes that you did can be really challenging for parents um, during this transition. And so I think one way to really help with these feelings that come with transitioning is to think of stepping back as more of a shift from being their voice to being their safety net. And so you're not really stepping back, but you're you know, you are stepping back, but you're not stepping out. Um, and so as we've talked about, 
we know that support is such an important piece of advocacy that there will be times that even though your child's advocating for themselves, they might still need you as a support system and as backup. And so this can kind of help you feel like you still are able to support them and focusing on your new role as their safety net um, rather than their voice. And so in terms of young adults with SMA, there are a lot of unique challenges that come with advocacy. And some of these barriers that parents of kids with SMA may, you know, may not have experienced the same way that young adults will or adults will. Um, there's a lot of similarities, but there are a few differences. Um, and so when advocating for themselves, young adults with SMA may face barriers um, of not being heard. And so these may be systemic barriers, things like accessibility to spaces, you know, maybe being unable to vote because of your local poll not being accessible, um, or also society perceptions such as ableism. Uh, and so there are additional challenges that, be, you know, where young adults with disabilities are perceived as being dependents. And so there's often a big barrier in being taken seriously from others. Uh, many young adults will advocate for themselves and be dismissed um, either from their age or their disabilities. Oftentimes young adults um, who are advocating, the person they're advocating to will speak to the workers or parents rather than themselves. Um, and so that's just an extra component um, that many young adults and adults with SMA face. Um, and then another component for being heard comes with safety. Um, I've heard from many young adults and adults that there's an, there's an element to feeling safe where they feel like they need to people please in order to get their needs met. And so young adults or adults need supports from their caregivers and professionals in order for them to get their needs met and to stay safe. And so in those moments, it can be really challenging to speak out when another person holds the power, so to say. Um, adults may worry about advocating for their needs for the fear of upsetting the person and compromising their safety. And so they may choose to just stay silent and sacrifice their needs instead. Um, and so this is why it is so important to teach kids and young adults that they are allowed to speak up for themselves and how to do this so that they can still stay safe moving forward. So kind of like we went over with what kids need to know, um, I wanted to go through some things that young adults with SMA need to know as they move through this transition to self-advocacy. So they need to know that they know themselves best, even if professionals challenge their beliefs of what their needs are, they themselves are the experts of themselves. They need to know that they can make their own decisions about their care, that they're the leader of their, their care, their life, and that they have a right to accessing care and support. They also need to know that they have a community of support backing them up, which includes you as a parent. So like we mentioned, support is a really big piece of advocacy. And so this might look like you supporting them, their friends, their care teams, and other peers with disabilities as well. And so lastly, young adults need to know that they can be independent members of society. And they will have a lot of messaging throughout their life, whether that's overt or subliminal, that tells them that they are less than for needing support and needing the support of others. And so it's really important to make sure that young adults know that these narratives are incorrect and that they're able to have a, they, they're able to have a full life and they have a right to having a full life like everybody else. And so when young adults have these core beliefs as their foundations, they will feel much more confident in fighting for what they deserve and what they have a right to. 
So just like parents of kids with SMA, adults and young adults have the same three ingredients to advocacy, which is the knowing what you're fighting for, using strong communication, and taking care of yourself. And so for SMA, for young adults and adults with SMA, knowing what you're fighting for is a big piece of advocacy. This looks like educating yourself on your rights, what you're entitled to, what you have access to. And this, a big part of this is to connect with others with similar lived experiences. And so talking to your peers in your community, finding out how they navigated barriers and advocacy in similar situations um, can be really helpful to exploring how to advocate in a way that feels good for you and gets your needs met. So this is very similar to parents with kids with SMA. Same thing goes for the strong communication. Um, this is definitely a big piece of it, especially when kids and adults have the people-pleasing tendencies to feel safe. Um, and so it's really important to you know, bring in that extra piece of support and that extra person to help you, um, you know, navigating this area. Um, and strong communication also will be applied to whatever form of advocacy you're working through, whether that's in person, in the community, and online. And then taking care of yourself. Same thing, making sure that you are getting your needs met and knowing that, you know, advocacy is really challenging and exhausting. And so for young adults and parents with us, or and young adults and adults with SMA, advocacy is something that they will be engaging in in the rest of their life. And so it's very much a marathon and not a sprint. And so it's really important to make sure that you're taking care of yourself and I also think it's important to mention for young adults and adults with SMA that um, it's okay if you make mistakes along the way. I think a lot of adults with disabilities um, feel a pressure in the community to make sure that they are always advocating and that they're always able to make change. And this is not always the case. Um, you know, we're human and even when you try your best, things might not go as planned. And so what matters most is that you try your best and use your voice for what matters to you. And that's all you can do at the end of the day. There are some things that are just gonna be out of your control and that's okay. And the last, which goes for every person who's affected by SMA is to lean on your community. And so I think everyone here can agree that finding others who have shared lived experiences really help us learn from each other, share knowledge, um, resources, and really feel less alone. And so community is such an integral part of advocacy. And it's even the reason that we're all here right now. You know, Cure SMA Canada as a community um, can really be that person that you can lean on. And, finding others with similar experiences. Um, and so we really wanna make sure that we lean on each other as we advocate and fight for change together. Just wanna throw in there that one of the things that we do as an organization is provide opportunity for peer support. So if somebody is feeling overwhelmed or wants to attack something together, um, they can reach out to us if they want to communicate with somebody within their own group. And it doesn't need to be within your province or community to feel that support, even outside of your province. It's, it's an amazing connection, and we're happy to do that. Curious yeah. McKenna has been incredible for community building. You guys do such great work. Um, so just before we move into the Q&A section, uh, I first want to say thank you for listening and for your time. Uh, I hope you took something away from this and I'm looking forward to hearing any thoughts or questions during the Q&A period. Um, I also want to take a moment to encourage you to reach out for support if you're struggling with advocacy 
or any other disability related challenges. Um, it can be really overwhelming and you don't have to go through it alone. Um, and so if you want support in these areas and you're looking for someone to talk to, um, if you live in Ontario, I am, you know, available to chat or do a consultation um, to help explore what supports you're looking for. And if you're not in Ontario as well, I'm also happy to help you reach out to someone in your area who's familiar with disabilities and can help you um, and your family move through these challenges as well. And that is all I have, but thank you again for being here. And I am looking forward to chatting further. Okay, hey, Shanna, I see you have a question. Go ahead and unmute yourself and go right ahead and, and speak. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, so I just switched to my headset. Um, so it's been a while since I've spoken to you, Susie, but I really, when I saw this, hold on, I'm gonna try throwing my camera on quickly. Um, where's camera? Um, oh, sorry guys. So everyone, I have a son who's seven years old who has SMA type one. It has been a battle. The past two years has taken my advocacy skills to another level. And like just listening to this, like I wish I had a bit of this before all of it, but I couldn't get him to school. He, um, we need a nurse to be with him. There are no nurses. And I'm sure a lot of you know this story. I'm trying. Um, and it's been a nightmare in Ontario. I live in Ontario. I live in on the east, close to Coburg. Um, it has been a nightmare. His online virtual school for him was interesting. It ended up being, I spoke to the school for years and years, like over the year, I went up to the superintendent, I went to the MPP, I went to the um, ombudsman. I, where did I end up with? At the ombudsman, then I ended up with a lawyer. So um, it was a lot, it took a lot of me. It affected me a lot. Like even the conversation with the superintendent still affects me, like her comments it I'm still in shock by it what she had told me like she decided to give me parenting advice and it, yeah exactly Susie <laughs> and I didn't even think to reach out to cure SMA I should have because like I'm talking and no one's understanding like the whole school didn't understand like this child is learning like he needs to learn like he's not not learning like this is how he learns and um I, Shanna, I would have come out there I, and if you do still struggle I would come out there and yeah it like yeah like honestly like I think a while ago I thought about it but then I just gave up because you get yeah. to this, oh, this no. like you just sort of like I'm done like I don't know what to do I couldn't sleep at night like it was like this child deserves an education and I can't even get him to that and so the lawyer keep my fingers crossed as I said hopefully we have a plan in place for our home nurses to go with him. Um, we'll see. Um, but I honestly, Brooklyn, like listening to you was amazing. Thank you very much. I think I've forgotten to reach out to the SMA community. Like I've reached out to the community that we're just like on Facebook and stuff, but it's still not, SMA is its own yeah. group and I've completely missed that yeah. mm -hmm. so where are you at now with um well today the lawyers the school board lawyer and the lawyer we got for him are seeking to get a contract hopefully to sign because it was a liability for the school to have him our nurses go and it was heartbreaking like it's a liability and I can't get him an he can't get an education like this is his only social output like I can't send them to camp I can't can't access a lot of things um but hopefully I have my fingers crossed I'll keep you up to date for sure Susie um on yeah. the outcome because I don't know if there's other families in Ontario because I am struggling with also people understanding SMA like yeah. he is cognitive like anyone with SMA is cognitively fine and yeah. they're just Anyways, but I will reach out for sure, and especially if it Please works. Do. 
because, yeah. uh, you know, I can connect you with other families that have been and have fixed this problem. I know of families that have gone to, to take a lawyer and they won there. And yeah, people have been removed from jobs. I've removed wow. people from a job. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, inclusion like and equality is very, very important. And not just for a student, but for all of us, you know, this, yeah. there are laws in Canada to support um, people like us. Um, absolutely. Yeah. So we can yeah. have a talk. Yeah. For sure. Thank you. And I just wanted to share that, like for anybody who's going through, like, even though you want to give up, like what Brooklyn said, take a break. Um, yeah. I wish I had, I had someone to lean on. And again, like I missed I didn't even think of this group, um, but I got through it. And now I know and just more power in my, like in our toolkit as being advocates, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, we can also, if um, you do end up with more problems and you need support, we can create a working group, Brooklyn, okay. myself, and other families that are maybe in your position. And, uh, you know, I, like I said, I go to Ontario quite often when it's not COVID. And I'm happy to stomp myself down to wherever you need it to be to advocate as a patient, national patient organization. It will carry some weight for you. Yeah. And yeah. Thank you, Susie. I truly appreciate that. Welcome. Does anybody else have something they'd like to share? Hi, Brooklyn. Very good presentation. Uh, our son uh, has SMA type 3, he's eight years old, uh, and I think he's, become, he's becoming more aware of his limitation. And he's asking a little bit more question, which is fine. Uh, sometimes we're not quite sure what to tell because they're pretty uh, deep question like, am I going to have that when I'm going to be a father? Well, my kids have SMA uh, when they, so I mean, he's only eight years old. So we're trying to make him focus on the positive stuff, what he can, can do and not, cannot do. Uh, but sometimes, again, uh, it's taking us by surprise and uh, is having a little bit of an emotional aspect to us as, as parents, right? So uh, as most parents, we always feel a little bit of a guilt because our child got that from us giving them the gene. We got over this throughout the, throughout the year, but it's what to tell him to make him aware that he's not alone. He's going to be fine. He's going to be okay. Uh, you have us with you. As a team, you have a, a sister that loves you and everything else. So it's uh, still pretty challenging to give them the right answer to make them feel like they're not alone. And I know like he's due for his uh, next injection in three weeks. And now the fatigue is coming back because as the dosage, I guess he's due for his next dose. And you're going to have more of those chat and more of those questions coming up. So it's always been like that for the last year and a half. So any advice or tips you can give us? <laughs> One of the big things I would ask, is he in, like, does he have a lot of peers around him with disabilities? So that's a really big thing that can help a lot of kids is to know that when they're on their own and they, they don't see anyone else um, to follow and, and to see someone else's success and to see them kind of thrive, they, they feel like they might not be able to do that. And so kind of finding um, even if it's, you know, a few, a few friends that have similar abilities to him to recognize, you know, if they're a few years older to see that you still can be a father with SMA, you still can have a career and a great life and go to school and live independently and really let, let that kind of guide, you know, he'll be questioning that. And I think it's important and really valuable to have that community around him that, he, he knows that he, he, there's nothing wrong with him and that there's, he's going to be able to achieve very similar things. Um, so that would be one of the big things I would definitely recommend is getting him to see, you know, representation and see other people um, that he can see himself in as well. I think that's a really great point. It's one of the reasons we developed the SMA family camp is to bring people together parent not only for the kids that have SMA but for the adults that have it for the siblings for the parents it, there's a community that is developed through the camp that gives a sense of identity that I'm okay 
I'm not the only one because in our own little communities, you don't see somebody else with SMA or if you see somebody with a disability, it may be somebody that's globally disabled as you know, mentally disabled as well. It's not the same. So it is a, a, you know, an issue with identifying with others that are exactly the same. And we have had kids that came into camp the first time feeling very much alone. I can't and leaving with an ability that they didn't even know they had. I can go hiking, I can go kayaking, I can go biking, I can get married one day, I can have kids. This has all been done and is being done and, and they just need to see it and feel it. And it's providing that opportunity, just like Brooklyn's saying. Um, Sarja, I'm hoping I'm saying your name right, but it's, yes, yes. your hand up. Yes, Susie, that's correct, Sarbjot. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, for this amazing presentation, Brooklyn and Susie. Um, you know, so my son, he will be four years old, actually, tomorrow. He was diagnosed with type 3 in December. Um, and, you know, um, it, it has been challenging from the aspect that, you know, from a parent aspect that am I doing enough for him? You know, am I, is, is my advocacy also enough, you know, sometimes like, especially with him because his, he's on spin raza, his injections don't go well. Um, he, he gets this CSF leak inside the spine, which causes him Im immense pain. And then he has to be readmitted to, to the hospital where he's kept for two, three days. And sometimes they have to give him steroids to um, ease the inflammation around the spine so that he's able to get back to where he was before. So it's just even advocating with the neuromuscular team. You know, I know they're experts, but still just like uh, always asking them that, hey guys, like, did you use the correct needle? Did you guys like, it, it, you know, can we lay him down extra hour or two hours so that he does not get into that situation, you know? So sometimes I feel bad. Sometimes I feel bad that I should not be questioning the doctors. I mean, because I know they know probably more than me. Like they, I mean, they have studied this, but um, it's just frustrating, right? When you, when you see those things happening again and again, and which is avoidable stuff like that and small things like as I think Susan mentioned, like I know her case is different but we were trying to get Metab into a preschool. Uh, the preschool was not taking him in, you know, because again, I mean, with type three, yes, he's able to walk, but he falls frequently, you know, they get tired. So he needs like an EA or some, someone to always wash, like so that no one pushes him around and he doesn't fall, you know, so it was a battle like, and luckily I, I, I mean, not luckily, but I gave up the battle because I was like, I'm done with this. That's fine if he doesn't go to preschool, probably just just go to school again. But, you know, listening to everyone talk now is like, I should not have given up, you know, I should have pursued it because that's his right. That's, I mean, he, he needs to mingle with other kids, you know, because I know COVID actually put on a lot of extra pressure on, especially the young kids, because especially in Ontario, right? Because our lockdown was for so long, there were not too many places where you could take them and stuff. So we thought that at least if he goes to preschool, especially because when we first got the diagnosis, like he was so in and out of the hospital because like the, the spin rosa doses didn't go well, right? So we thought it'll be a good change for him if he goes to preschool, he's playing with kids of his age. But yeah, I'm actually, you know, other thing I'm very surprised is that the lack of awareness that exists among even the school boards, right? Like, especially now uh, we had been, in, in talk with, uh, with with our school board here because he will be going to school in September and um, and, and and that made me think think that I bet Metab is not the only SMA type three patient in Ontario right why don't these school boards connect together and have a plan already right why do like as a parent we have to reiterate the same things over and over again you know just some thoughts. I mean, it's uh, uh, not with SMA, but probably with other disabilities too, right? There should be a set criteria that the schools should follow and, you know, I mean, train their staff better, you know, just my, just my thoughts on it. Absolutely. Yeah, one of the first things that came to mind 
um, at the beginning of your comments was to not feel comfortable questioning the doctors. Right. And I think, and I think that's a really common feeling for a lot of parents where they know that, you know, they didn't go to med school, they didn't go to teacher's college. And so they feel like they aren't allowed to question it and ask questions. And I think it's important to make sure that we, we remind ourselves that you are the parent of your child and you know your child best. And even though they may have experience, they don't know your specific child and those unique needs that they have. And so mm -hmm. you really have to be that voice for them where, you know, it's okay to question doctors because they don't, they don't know at all. And that's something that we have to remind ourselves too, that, you know, we can acknowledge their opinion, but also know that at the end of the day, you know, your child best and, um, and that you are, you are that expert that they, they don't have that experience raising a child with SNA as well. Yeah, I, I back that up. Um, you know, people don't realize that they really are in the driver's seat of their health care, whether they're an adult or a parent of a child. Uh, you know, we were raised in a society of, uh, you know, the teacher or the doctor is, is um, superior in some way, but it should be a partnership. And uh, we need to acknowledge that we actually are the ones that have final say. And sometimes we're restricted. Um, you know, those of us that are adults with SMA, you know, we have been fighting quite a bit to try to access treatment. Uh, Jeff and Jackie, and you know, you guys can back that up 100%. Um, you know, it's, it's, whether you're advocating for treatment or advocating for something else in the health care or the, you know, just even to get into the mall safely. And, you know, there's so many things and it's exhausting. You have to choose your battles one by one. Don't look at the mountain, look at the first step onto the hill and uh, pick your first battle and get that behind you before you look at everything that is in front of you what's the most important thing and get that done and get it behind you. Hi, yeah. Hi everybody. Hi. I want to say thank you, uh, Brooklyn, for the presentation. My son uh, will turn uh, nine in, uh, in uh, two weeks and uh, it's uh, like the healthy of uh, our boy. Uh, I appreciate to be, uh, I don't know in, uh, in English, at uh, prévoyant, uh, to keep a uh, uh, longer d'avance. Uh, you, does that make sense? Does somebody can help me to Maybe the you? interpreter. Say the whole sentence in French, Jan, and then the interpreter can say it in English. Garder, uh, garder une longueur d'avance. Keep uh, me a step ahead. Yes, so I appreciate uh, the presentation and I want to signify uh, <clears throat> it seems like um, when uh, some uh, is, like uh, education is like the health, uh, when it's a uh, provincial jurisdiction, we see a lot of inequality because we have the same problems here in Quebec. <clears throat> it's exacerbated with the COVID uh, time. But um, definitely, uh, we don't receive uh, all uh, the, the needs uh, we, we have uh, and uh, we have the right to receive because uh, we, are, we are obliged to do uh, school at home. So normally, uh, the, the, the school uh, provide uh, a lot of service like uh, orthophonist and uh, ergo and everything like this. But because we make uh, the school at home, we don't have uh, access uh, to this uh, service uh, so mm -hmm. we have to fight 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 uh, and yeah. um, often it's not um, because they don't want but they, they put some rule to make some norms and because we are unique uh, we don't fit uh, anywhere and uh, often i understand the the people who uh, have to act on the on the files miss some uh, formation knowledge on the uh, uh, risk the on the risk uh, gestion uh, how you say gestion uh, gérer, administrate the risk uh, to take a risk because uh, you have to um, to mark up uh, 
outside of the box. You you cannot just uh, say A, B, or C, and you have to justificate something, and it's opening uh, uh, what the panda. So they they when they they receive the formation, they they have uh, the the information. It's better to don't touch this and don't do mm. anything. But when we call uh, the Ministry of Education, they tell, oh, no, you know, the box is not, uh, it's more flexible than you think. You just have uh, to ask and uh, you uh, normally uh, receive uh, open mind and uh, collaboration. But it's definitely not the case. So we knocked to a lot of door and uh, I want uh, to tell uh, to everybody, uh, <laughs> Don't give up. We fight together. You're not alone. It's great to to share this uh, and listen. We're not alone. And may, maybe maybe it's like for the the health uh, thing. Uh, maybe uh, a national way to 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 be sure everybody uh, are inclusive uh, could uh, help uh, to to push uh, some equality. Absolutely. Yeah, one one thing, you know, if we sat back and accepted limitations that are placed before us, none of our community would have treatment. Um, people would not be going to school, they'd still be in institutions. I mean, there, there's so many things that along the way, somebody put their foot down and said, no, that's not acceptable. We are going to be accepting change and you will implement that. That is 100% how it has been for accessing treatment for SMA in Canada. It has been baby steps along the way. There are still people without treatment, but we're on the cusp of getting it for them. We're not accepting that they're not going to be receiving treatment. It's just we haven't been able to force that square peg in every hole, but you know, more holes are getting filled all the time. And it won't be long, more will be in there. Sorjat, did you have a, a question or comment? No, Susie, I think maybe I accidentally pressed the hand. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. It's okay. It's a friendly hand. Yeah, a friendly hi to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff or Jackie, did you guys have something you wanted to, to share with everyone? All right, then if everybody is finished sharing and asking questions. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, um, Brooklyn, how you deal uh, with uh, impatience? If uh, my boy are impatience uh, for, for me, he, he, he think I'm not too fast or we are supposed to to do everything you want right now. So do you have some cue uh, for in the future to, to help us and my son to deal with, uh, you know, ambition versus uh, this uh, frustration and uh, impatience versus, uh, he, you know, he deserve uh, to, to receive uh, all what he needs, but uh, I, we have uh, to, to, to deal uh, with the fact he, he have to, to, to ask us uh, on a good way <laughs> too, if he want to keep uh, the, the, the caregiver and uh, friends around us, uh, around you. So do you have some, uh, some cue to tell us uh, how moderate uh, the ambition, but not, not moderate, but um, how to find the balance between uh, objective ambition and uh, the reality of uh, often it's, it's slow to 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 make uh, to have some solution or a new way to access. Yeah, I think one of the big things would be to simply name it for them. You know, to let them know that you hear them and that you you have you know you've heard their need and you acknowledge it and that you're working on it. And then afterwards, saying, you know, we did this. Thank you for your thank you for waiting for me or thank you for your patience or I, I'm, I love the way you waited for that. Um, just to let them know that, you know, you don't have to meet as a parent 
it, it's really instinctual to feel like you have to meet every demand really quick and really urgently. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, you know, learning patience and learning to wait is, is a skill that is important as well. So, um, you know, narrating that, you know, you've heard them and that you're, you're working on it. And then afterwards, you know, saying, Hey, we waited and we're good (laughs) is something that can just really help them feel heard and validated. That was a great answer. That was a great answer. Uh, Jeff has as well here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to remember, it, like you said, you talk about the camp and the community. Uh, you know, we, we stopped to meet uh, Amy last week. Uh, we had the chance to talk uh, with uh, Emil. And uh, it's amazing how we lost the opportunity or because everybody is uh, so busy. But uh, I just listened, uh, Janik, your son is uh, eight years old. So my son is nine years old. and. My God, he don't have a lot of friends because he don't have the time or uh, opportunity to make a lot of relationships. So uh, we have to continue to find a new way to connect everybody together. <laughs> Thanks for the, for this that. opportunity to see. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Jeff, did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone. Thanks for doing for the amazing presentation. And- as an adult with SMA, I've had to advocate for my needs and support with other organizations over the years, and I've had a lot of success. But these strategies are really, really important. So please use everything that Brooklyn said and use your networks and really fight for your children's needs um, because it, it is very important to keep up the great work. That was great. Love it. Thanks. <laughs> All right, with that, I think we'll uh, we'll end the session. It's a, a great joint. Uh, if you can join the next session, the two work together really well uh, with um, mental and physical and bringing holistically everything together for us. Um, I I would like to say a great big thank you to Brooklyn for really a well put together session and uh, mind provoking and and skill in, you know, I, I think we left. Did you leave? There you are. <laughs> you have providing skills for us. Uh, thank you so much for this. Yeah, and we look forward me. to your next session. It's too bad you're only doing in Ontario because I would take you in a heartbeat in New Brunswick. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem because we have like uh, clinicians and psychologists and so forth, but we haven't been able to find somebody that deals with rare uh, disease and the, uh, stuff like that. So it's been kind of difficult to try to support our son. So we want to go for ourselves, put to support our son, but having somebody like you uh, close by would be awesome, but we'll find other ways, I guess, but uh, good job in Ontario. <laughs> would you provide virtual sessions, Brooklyn? So unfortunately with my college, we're regulated. We're the only province that's regulated. So I'm not allowed to, um, work with anyone outside of Ontario, which is really unfortunate. Um, I, I, most of my sessions right now, especially, are virtual anyway, um, just with COVID and, and safety protocols. So it's it's unfortunate that it, it wouldn't apply mm-hmm. elsewhere because no, to me, it's, it's the same thing. But yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All right, well, thanks everyone for attending. Hopefully we'll see you at the next session. Have a great afternoon.